So, so with that, I'd like to hand it over to Balwinda. Hi. Thank you, John. Um, I was thinking maybe if we just turned this session into, you know, stories about uh, Alexa, it would be way more interesting, keep us all awake, especially since it's the session after lunch. Um, we all have, how many people have an Alexa at home? Yeah, and you have your own set of stories, don't you? So I don't know what happens with Alexa at your house, but I can tell you what happens in a household, household with two teenage boys. So one of them goes, Alexa, play Hooked on the Feelings by Galaxy of the Guardian. And the younger one will spring up from the couch, jump halfway across the family room, Alexa, stop, and then hit the microphone button right there. Welcome, Alexa, to our house. So today, uh, before we start, I have two slides of legalese. Yes, we're special, so I get two. One is the normal copyright slide, and this one is Safe Harbor, which basically says that everything I'm going to talk about, which includes the vision that AppDynamics has for IoT, um, it's not a GA product, and there are no committed uh, roadmap or uh, timelines at this point. So, if um, something else takes your interest and you do decide to leave the room early, please take one thing with you. Do not miss the general session tomorrow because the team has put together a live demo on IoT at the keynote stage. So do please come visit us there. What am I gonna talk about today? So we're gonna talk about the Internet of Things, which by the way is not new. It's been around for 15 years, but why is there a buzz now? And the enablers that have caused IoT in the consumer world also bring it into the enterprise. What does it mean for enterprise? We'll look at some verticals, the value it brings. We'll understand um, what the risks it brings to. After that, I'll do a deep dive into only the portions that are new. Uh, because I'm pretty sure you are performance monitoring experts uh, way more than I am. So I will focus on things that are new, and with that we'll get into what we at AppDynamics think uh, the monitoring solution looks like. And finally, and probably the most important part, is let's have a conversation, right? I would like to know um, what are the devices you have in your enterprise, what are your pain points, and if there is potential for us to work together and come up with that first solution. So it's in our lives and we already know that. So what really caused it to get to scale, right? The first thing that happened in the last decade was the, uh, the cost of the sensors drop. It's possible to buy high quality, high grade sensors now for less than a dollar. Compute power has dropped, has increased 64 times for the same dollar amount. So one very interesting fact is that when AWS launched EC2 in 2006, the spec of the virtual machine at that time is what we carry in our pockets now. So compute power, we have way more of it and easily accessible. Ubiquitous connectivity. In the keynote today, David mentioned how people on the airplane want, the first thing they want to do is connect the device to Wi-Fi, and of course it's spotty, and then you get frustrated, right? But um, connectivity is available everywhere, and the cost has dropped 40 times in a decade. Now these sensors here, they generate tons and tons of data. So okay, we're, we generate a lot of data, we're able to stream it, um, we are able to process it, but, the last enabler is big data analytics. We are able to get meaning out of that. And together, this is where the trajectory has changed. It started with, are there any folks from IBM in the audience? So if you attend an IoT um, talk given by an IBM person, they'll tell you they've been doing Internet of Things for 15 years, and that is so true. But at that time, it was a gas pipeline that they were monitoring with sensors, and it was a niche area it's going to scale. So how does the enterprise change? Are there any people in the audience who already have devices that they're monitoring? Okay, so then let's take a look at few examples and uh, 
I'm sure that will get you thinking about where you would expect things to change um, your daily job. So retail. There are two parts of retail. First is the user experience, and second is inventory management. There are tons of connected devices that are there in the retail space now uh, for improving the user interface. One of them is smart shelves. So normal, a normal retail store can take up to a week to change the price tag on each shelf. With digital displays, it can be done with the click of uh, a button. Also, these, these uh, shelves can detect from a mobile app who the customer is and provide a very um, user-friendly customer experience. On the warehouse side, RFID tags and RFID readers are able to provide um, the entire chain uh, from manufacturing, distribution, retail consumption, and recycling. They're able to track the life of a product. What does this give us? Higher productivity, insights into customer behavior, and reduced costs. All good value. Let's look at connected cars. So the prediction is that around now there's about 10 to 15 percent of the cars that are connected. By 2020, there will be 250 million cars connected. And when they're connected, what does it offer us? So mechanics can remotely look into the car and see oh, which parts are going to fail and call you in for a service ahead of time. Um, you, there's uh, revenues available now. You could purchase music. You could do shopping right from your car. And then uh, merging of insurance with connected cars. What you see on the right side is an OBD2 port dongle, which uh, plugs into the OBD2 port. And insurance companies are able to provide usage-based premium models. And the values that this gives are remote access and new opportunities. And some of these things are overlapping. I'm just highlighting values for different use cases. Let's look at connected devices in the cities. So energy management and smart business. Um, earlier device manufacturers, H, pe uh, people who uh, would manufacture HVAC, they would just ship it and be done with it, right? Their problem was over. But now that they're connected, they are able to provide new services where they can monitor uh, the temperature and um, uh, energy of a smart building remotely. So it's a subscription-based model has come into place. The one on the right, so we have a lot of these in our off, near our office in San Francisco. And if you've ever driven into the city for a meal, you can either shell out $25 to $30 for parking, or if you do manage to get street parking, which doesn't normally happen, then you interrupt your meal every 20 to 25 minutes, go put a few more quarters in, go back to your meal, have a drink, come back and do the same thing. But now with these smart parking meters, you have a mobile app and you can extend your parking time as you need to. So energy conservation and enhanced customer experience. I think it's pretty clear now that there's a lot of value that these connected devices are bringing. Enhanced customer experience, which is near and dear to all of our hearts, higher productivity, new opportunities, together they help build the brand. So the slide deck was getting reviewed, and somebody said, you didn't put a citation for this one. Well, guess what? It's my quote. I made this up, and I say that IoT devices directly or indirectly impact the bottom line of a business. And I think we need to uh, give due consideration to this. So I'd like to take a moment here to pause and try to understand that IoT is not an incremental change. Smart connected devices is not an incremental change. It's a disruptive innovation. The first Fortune 500 company list was published in 1955. 88% of those companies do not exist today. And the reason they do not exist is because they could not, they were Fortune 500 companies, they could not cope up with innovation. They could not change themselves. So this morning at the keynote, we saw there are 250 year old companies. They're more than 100 year old companies. The only reason they've survived so long is because they were able to change themselves as trends changed. I love visuals. So this is the ice trade from the 19th century. It got eradicated. The entire business, the people who did that got eradicated. Yes, that's what the first refrigerator looked like. 
We're all familiar with this. My kids have never seen a floppy disk. They don't know what that is. And so it's really up to us. Do we want to be prey or do we want to be predator? We're in the middle of the fourth industrial revolution and this will change the world into a cyber physical world. So how does one succeed in this world? Well, of course, we need to identify, right? What, is, what can these new connected uh, devices bring to our business? Once we've identified that, then because people are not going to come with 15 years of experience, we have to build the technology. People will migrate from surrounding areas into this. For example, my background is uh, mobile uh, platforms. I did that uh, since 2000, but for the last two years now, I've been doing the Internet of Things. So people will migrate into it, so you build the techno a technology, uh, technology skills that you need. And then again, risks are not known, right? You have to proactively think what possibly could go wrong and then manage those risks. Now, if you do a Google search on the top risks for um, IoT, you're gonna get security and privacy as the top two ones. And they're the most talked about, most feared, most discussed risks of IoT. But try doing a Google search on the top four, seven, or 10 risks of IoT, and performance management is right up there. And that's where we come in. So managing the performance of these devices, the runtime, real-time performance management of devices. And then the other thing is, these devices talk to your back end. That's why they are called the Internet of Thing Things, right? Um, the business, which never the business back end services, which never had devices talking to them, can get impacted by performance of the devices and vice versa. Devices which never spoke to the cloud will get impacted if something changes on the back end. So let's deep dive into what's new. This is an architecture diagram that I put together, very simplified diagram. So you have uh, sensing devices on your left. They would talk to edge computing devices which aggregate all the data from different sensing devices through the internet, put it, send data back to your backend services, and sometimes there is a control feedback back, sometimes there is not. Alternately, you can have sensing devices that go straight directly into um, talking to the backend services. Mobile plays a big part in this because a lot of these devices are headless, and the mobile, whether it's a personal device or it's a tablet that you use in your enterprise, are, is the means of configuring and controlling these connected devices. Within these devices are embedded applications. And I will talk, one, about devices, understand what are the quirks, what things we need to be careful about. I'll talk a little bit about embedded apps and why they're different from mobile apps or uh, enterprise apps, backend apps. And finally, the connection to the cloud. So the first thing, as devices get into your enterprise and it starts impacting your day job, first thing to do is basically know your devices. So like I mentioned, when I started two years back, the first thing I struggled with is, so what is this internet of things thing, right? What is it? Um, it's a traditional embedded device, but that's not just it. You add connectivity. But even that's not just it, because now you've got a connected, traditional embedded device. It's only when it starts talking to backend uh, cloud services and either provides a value to the device or aggregates the value from all the devices to provide some other kind of value is when it really becomes this internet of thing thing. At this point, I'd like to take a moment because it's not directly on the path that I'm talking, but it's also really important for success. Traditional embedded devices have always been managed by operations technology uh, teams within a company. Cloud services have been managed by the IT teams. And now there is a convergence. And if this is not smooth, if it, on the organization side or the cultural side, there is not a smooth mixing of the two, there's not integration of the two, you could put the best tools and processes in place and still success will not be met. It's a very fragmented landscape. Mobile, smart, 
uh, phones have iOS and Android and Windows CE to some extent, right? But in the IoT space, it's very fragmented. And the only way to manage it is to categorize it. So use a bu bucket strategy. Going to identify three categories of devices. First is the edge computing devices. That's a connected car dashboard, a smart point of sale, a set smart set-top box, and a home gateway or an industrial gateway. What do they have in common? Typically, they're mains powered. Uh, they have the concept of an application framework. They have applications. They may or may not have a UI, uh, but they have decent amount of RAM and memory and CPU. And if this is the only device that's entering uh, your enterprise, you're in pretty good shape. Next on are sensing devices with routing. So these typically have a single usage. There's still a concept of an app and a device. The apps can get upgraded separately. In the first example, the apps, there are multiple kinds of apps. For example, a point of sale system. You would have a registered app, an inventory app. Somebody could create a special app for um, a resort. Somebody could create a special app for Vegas, right? Uh, shopping in Vegas or dining in Vegas. So there's different kinds of apps and they have their own life cycle. The same is not, um, here it's a single app. It's really a single functionality we're talking about. A thermostat, well it just does, it gets the temperature and that's pretty much it, right? Or the smart shelf has a bunch of sensors, it has connectivity and it's talking straight to the uh, back end. These are sensing devices without routing. Now these are when devices become very, very constrained. They probably may not even have an OOS on it. It could be bare uh, metal. Um, we're talking kilobytes of memory and they run probably something like Zigbee. So with this, um, let's get into, that's pretty much, you know your devices now. Let's figure out what we have for our uh, embedded applications. So web apps differ from embedded apps in the sense there are some things that we take for granted for web apps. It's running HTTP, HTTPS, uh, a stack, there is uh, JSON as the message format, and um, a few other things. But the same cannot be assumed for embedded applications. MQTT and AMQP, AMQP are application layer protocols that are getting a lot of traction. How many of these, there's another one called Coop. how many of these succeed? Only time can tell, but I would assume at least a couple will. You may not have uh, a protocol, like uh, your message format may not be JSON encoded. It could be uh, a binary format like CBAR or protobuf. And these are other things. And the reason this is, this is important is when you're looking for an agent to instrument your app, it should be able to work in the environment that you have, right? If, the, uh, if let's say for example, you have a device um, and it only speaks MQTT and you buy, get an instrumentation agent which only talks HTTP and there's not even an interface on your device, you can't even put a stack on it uh, to talk HTTP, well that agent's not going to work, right? So these are just some things to be very aware of when you're trying to find a solution for instrumenting your apps and devices. And finally, know your connection to the cloud. So this wasn't the best example, it's a probably not very slide friendly, but the reason I picked this up was because it highlights um, what a typical architecture would look like. It's from the Eclipse Foundation Ponte project. And we should basically, it's, I feel very confident to say that we should assume that there will be a hybrid architecture. There will be HTTP, there will be MQTT brokers, there might be a co-op server, there might be an AMQP, and then all these different apps will be talking different languages, different protocols, so there has to be some unifying bridge on top. And once we sort of know this, we actually now at least know what we have in-house and what we are looking out for. So are there any questions so far? Okay, so with this, we can move into uh, what the IoT team has been working at AppDynamics and what our vision of the world is. So this is what yesterday looked like to us, right? We have the end user and the instrument all the back end. This is what it looks like today. 
So now for a user, we have all these devices um, that are proxy devices. We shop through the Alexa. We um, do different activities through the car. We are able to connect the, through a smart home. So we have devices now that has knowledge about us and is able to talk to the backend uh, services. We have smart watches. So where we envision ourselves is the ability to instrument all of these devices and provide the same visibility, same performance, same latency that you are so used to from the backend side, from the mobile side, browser side, and other uh, parts of the stack. So this is our vision of the world. Now I'd like to take a little uh, moment here and say, let's try to identify where problems can happen. So I've picked up two use cases, fictitious use cases, but which can very well happen. So let's meet Teresa. She's directory, uh, director of IT services in a company. It's an inventory management company. So basically, her customers are people who are able to manage the inventory of their stores by using the web and mobile applications that uh, she manages. And um, recently, the company decided to embrace the Internet of Things and launched an RFID-based inventory management system. So what the company now provides is a solution. They've differentiated themselves from their co competition. They have uh, the uh, stores get uh, uh, equipped with RFID readers and RFID tags, and as the tags cross the in, um, merchandise with the tags progresses through the store, they're able to, in real time, um, be able to tell what is the inventory in stock, what needs to get ordered. So loss of inventory is a big problem. And not knowing in time where how much inventory is in a store is another cause uh, that causes revenue loss for retail. So they've launched this product. But guess what happened to her backend services? She's now seeing an unexpected load that is bringing down her systems. Well, IoT is not working that well for her, is it? So now we have the first example here is somebody in IT was completely just responsible for backend services. Devices got launched in the field, and there is unhappiness. Let's shift gears and meet Ivan. He's head of operations at a white goods company. So washers, dryers, refrigerators, all that kind of good stuff. And his job always was to manage the supply chain, to be able to deliver all these the uh, uh, washer dryers have a service contract, hand it over to the uh, service uh, people, and um, his life was good too, till somebody decided that, oh, but people might want to do their laundry remotely, or the service team would um, really like to be able to proactively send service personnel for repairs. Great idea, but it's not causing happiness for Ivan, because suddenly people have started complaining that their control panels are now unresponsive. So two sets of problems. One set of problem was somebody responsible for backend has devices causing problems, devices causing problems to the backend. Second is devices, which are now talking to the cloud, are causing problems to the devices. So where can, uh, where can problems happen? Devices can just become unavailable. As a backend person monitoring your devices, you don't know whether the device is even online or offline. Well, guess what? Maybe it's online, and you can ping it, but now it's unhealthy. And devices can become unhealthy because of a couple of reasons, right? Either the device itself, let's say it's low on power, right? And because it's low on power, the app has become, the embedded application has become sluggish. Or it can get vice versa, where the embedded application has a memory leak, and that is causing uh, power drainage on the device. So device unhealthy. Third one is everything is good at the device end, everything is good at the back end, but there's a connectivity problem. So application transaction health is poor. Last one is business service problems where the back end actually uh, has problems. But this is just a single view, right? You have one device talking to one back end service, but that's not the view of the world that we live in. So let's zoom out. Um, this is just another slide which talks more about all the different things to take care of. 
for devices. And we can spend some time here. So problems originating from aggregation of devices. What's the scale of these devices? We are not talking thousands or hundred thousands. We're talking millions of devices, hundreds and millions of devices. The volume of data that they generate, they can generate kilobytes of data, but if they generate it very frequently and very fast, over a million devices, you suddenly have way more data that your backend services need to absorb than they ever did in the past. So the volume of data. These are called the three Vs of data. Volume of data, velocity of data, and variety of data. Velocity of data. Well, guess what? Maybe you have a million devices and somehow nobody was thinking and they decided that all of them need to make a backend or a batch update at, the, at midnight. And so suddenly you have this load from a million devices because nobody, decided, they, nobody thought they need to be, it needs to be time staggered and your backend services are getting impacted. Variety of data. Maybe your number of devices is manageable, volume is decent, they, it's all nicely staggered, you don't have any bursts, but now you have a variety of data. There's just any number of application layer protocols you have to manage. A data, some data is coming in JSON, so others is coming in CBOR, protobuf, and so you have such a variety of data that that becomes problematic. Also, these devices are highly distributed and hybrid environments. So uh, one of the things I found this very interesting is that in 1990s, an acceptable response time for a web application was 10 seconds. And David mentioned this in the keynote this morning. But right now, if you have a one second response time, people, it goes unnoticed. But what really people want, the human brain likes instantaneous, and that's a 0.1 second response time. Now that is completely insane. But if people on the software side actually manage to do that, that automatically becomes a requirement for devices too. Because like we know, if millennials are part of the population, they want it now. So user response time expectation. So nowhere in this entire transaction uh, can we afford latencies. With this, I'd like to talk about what, how we envision what an enterprise grade performance monitoring solution should look like. And we already have a lot of the pieces of the puzzles. I'm just going to add on what is IoT, right? So the ability to instrument all kinds of applications, whether they're backend, database, but also all kinds of devices, depending on how much uh, CPU they have, how much power, they can, power budget they have, uh, what kind of OS they're running, what kind of language they're running. So the ability to instrument all kinds of apps on devices. And then to be able to aggregate all of this at scale. But then, like we said, we already talked about the two examples with Teresa and Ivan, and they're not in isolation, right? You need to be able to correlate what is happening from the device to the back end to back. And I didn't even bring into any of these examples the relationship with mobile, but that would be a third player in it. And of course, all of this we want in a single uh, pane view for the enterprise. We need deep instrumentation to be able to come to where the problem is. We need to be able to diagnose problems quickly, provide alert mechanisms, and then finally be able to measure what the business impact is. We heard at the keynote this day from uh, uh, Koss, this was his name? Koss, yeah, he was talking about how they just talk about only the business value, that's what the language they use, they don't talk about IT terms. So be able to measure the business impact of all of this. That would make for a very sweet enterprise grade performance monitoring uh, solution of the future with uh, connected devices in the mix with everything else. So now let's go back and finish our story that we started and figure out what happened with Teresa and Ivan. So to recap, the business services were seeing an unexpected load and it was bringing down the system. So Teresa uh, has AppDynamics uh, Java APM on the back end. She also uses her web and mobile uh, browser for EUM. She went and uh, went ahead and got the RFID reader app instrumented uh, with the IoT agent. There's a little asterisk that says it's all early access. Um, and then the BT correlation screen was able to give to her that the load was coming from the RFID reader. Well, it turns out that it was updating the GPS coordinate 
of where an item was tracked e every minute, whether the data was there or not, well, that was an easy fix. They updated the app on the RFID reader and normalcy returned. Oh yes, if, if you're doing slides and you're looking for a same person, happy and unhappy, you don't find that. So I just slapped a smiley on top of it. Ivan, so his problem was that um, his uh, wa washer dryers had unresponsive control panels. Well, he knew that the problem started after the, it got upgraded to talk to the backend services, and so he went over to the IT department and said, you know, I know you guys have tools to look into uh, your backend solution, so help me out here. Well, they also had a Java APM on the back end, and Ivan worked with the IT department. They got a um, uh, early access IoT agent on the control panel, and they found that the backend call that was, uh, was uh, resulting in a lot of HTTP errors were all originating from this um, washer dryer. And turns out that when the IT department updated their endpoint, they forgot that they had these devices also talking to them and nobody uh, told the device team that they had to update their software as well. Well, once that was figured out, I even worked with the device management system and got an OTA patch deployed, another smile. So with this, my side of the story is done and uh, I'm gonna open it for questions. Sure, uh, we have a mic here. The end user monitoring, that's, that is a channel that we are exploring right okay, now. So it's yes. going to your servers and then we pull it down to our OT. Uh, yes, so the EUM right? cloud is what you're talking about? Yes. yes, that is what we have. So we already have um, at the Expo Center and we're also going to do a live demo tomorrow, but that's exactly what we've done. We've, we uh, pull out data from these constrained devices and send EUM beacons to okay. the server. So IoT, one of the challenges is uh, the platform itself is not standardized, right? Like, so the agents that you guys are developing, are you concentrating on any specific platform or is it open to the? So uh, we are uh, very cognizant of the fact that um, uh, it is very fragmented. Uh, and so we are going to uh, go with an approach where we can cover as many devices as is possible. Uh, we, I would love to talk more with you, and uh, for that we actually have a uh, this thing where you can sign up. It's tinyurlcom iot appd and it's a Google form, and you can sign up from that. And uh, we can discuss more about what it is. But uh, we are very cognizant of the fact that it's a fragmented um, uh, uh, platforms that we are dealing with, and so our solution um, has to be able to cater to all of those. Other questions? Yes. This is keeping me fit. Yeah. I'm curious how you plan to uh, deal with the acceptance of the device teams on adding a AppD agent on their device software. Because I feel like AppD typically is, is mostly an IT software, like has been accepted by the IT engineers, right? But I know like in my own group, the device engineering team are using something of their own to monitor uh, crashes and so on, their devices, right? Like how do you uh, help them adopt an AppD solution that they don't know anything about? Okay, so um, we've spoken to um, some customers and one of the things, and, and we're open to listening more to this one, but some of the things we've heard is that they are actually open 
um, to instrumenting the devices themselves. So one of the things with embedded devices is device manufacturers are very reluctant because they already have budgets on response times, budgets on how much CPU they can use, and they don't want um, auto instrumentation or something that you can just slap on the device. That's one factor. They want full control, and that's why uh, we are leaning more towards an SDK approach. Uh, the second thing is um, there are a lot of operations teams that will actually not deploy software or hardware devices if they don't have a, a monitoring solution in it. The third factor is going back to device manufacturers. They have this pain point already that they do not have visibility into their devices. And so they actually consider this as a feature add-on and will allocate uh, CPU and RAM budget to it for the piece of software that goes on it. So uh, unless we hear otherwise from device manufacturers or uh, customers that this is not the approach to go with, from everything we've heard so far, it seems that's the right way to go. Did I answer your question? Thanks. Any more questions? I've got uh, kind of one question. I know as when I was looking into IoT uh, last year, one of the things which I saw, there was all different um, standards for network connectivity to different devices. You mentioned kind of one called uh, Zigbee. There's a whole host of different ones. I just wanted to get your thoughts and opinions on regards to what network standards you think will really prevail in the next couple of years. Um, so uh, there are different layers uh, of the stack, right? So if you go at the application layer protocols against uh, HTTP, we have MQTT, AMQP, and CoAP. Out of that, MQTT seems to be uh, a very strong player at this time. The other two we'll see depending on the uh, thing. So for in those cases, we would end up instrumenting the MQTT brokers, and if the device has an HTTP interface, we could still send our beacons over HTTP while reading the MQTT payload. If not, then we would have another MQTT broker somewhere, our own, right, and become a bridge. If we go down, that's the application layer, right? If we go down um, lower, you mentioned uh, Zigbee and non-IP protocols. So we haven't given too much consideration yet to the non-IP non part of it because non-IP ultimately, before it talks to the cloud, is going to go through an IP gateway and our first focus is everything that's IP, and we'll worry about those devices later on. Did I answer your question? Yeah, that's right, yes, it's all about IP, uh, IP first. Yes, and with IPv6, uh, the, you'll find more and more, at least the newer devices, will have IP stacks on them. It's very low footprint, and you'll find a lot more of them there. So, so we have enough market to cover uh, at this point. Fantastic. Any more questions? From Dell, uh, Dell has like a edge gateway, which is an IoT gateway, and uh, does AppD has some profiling, which can get all these metrics out of these gateways? So if you sign up there or send me an email, I would love to talk more. So we're definitely looking for uh, customers for our uh, early engagements. So okay. I would okay. love to speak to you. Sure. Thank you. How much of the uh, development is happening in the back end? Like in, for, for the back end URLs that come in, is there like profiles that you can that you can set like, oh, washing machine, these are the kinds of data that comes in. A car, these are the kinds of data that comes oh, in. Oh, so vertical. Rather than on the, on the devices itself, the data that comes back, how much development efforts are going on analyzing the data that comes to the back end? So this will be vertical and use case specific data, right? Right, but, but basically it depends on the use case, right? What data comes, so you're saying domain-specific data, right? So whether we are able to interpret domain-specific data. So um, since this is early stages, I think um, working on domain-specific uh, data will come later. We're gonna first work with all the set of data that covers a larger, um, a larger uh, number of 
verticals and device types. The reason I'm asking that is like, isn't it tough for you to convince all the manufacturers and the sensors, those guys, rather, it's, isn't it easy for you to develop models on your end, on, on the AppD side, on the back end, so that when you get the data, oh, th this is the model that you can run. Let's say you, you want to ship your software to uh, Samsung, the TVs or washing machines and those kind of things. You develop the pre-built model for those guys and then give them rather than putting putting your uh, putting the agent on all the devices that they are trying to manufacture that that's where i'm trying to get so so your your thing is that we are going to you're assuming in your question that we are going to build the model which we include in each agent that goes on the device correct that's your assumption if i if i understood correctly okay so so it's it's not something that we're thinking about right now but I'm Maybe. happy to have a one-on-one -on -one yeah, conversation let's take a, with you. Let's yeah. take you offline that one. Yeah. Uh, any more questions? No. Well, I'd like to give uh, Balwinder a big round of applause. Thank you very much. And, and and don't don't forget this, right? You might just win that. Take it home. Have your stories. Do do drop me a line when you have your stories. I think that's the most fun part. Thank you very much.